today's episode of the Top 11 Podcast. The final round is sponsored by that. This is the championship round. This is it. This is the final round of our Top 11 tournament. You guys have been listening to it for the last several weeks. We opened with the Top 49ers games of the decade. That was followed by the Golden State Warriors and then the Giants. And now this week, the final bloodbath begins. What are the top 11 games from all three teams? What are the games? What? Wh- where do they all land? Where do the 49ers games rank against the Warriors, against the Giants? Two dynasties versus, versus an upstart. is a lot, of, lot to t- talk about, a lot to unpack. I have a strong feeling all of our lists might be completely different. I have no idea where we're going to go, and we're very excited to prevent the, present these lists to you. But before we get started, Raymond, why don't you let them know where they can find us? You can always like us on Facebook.com slash The Goldcast, and you can follow us on Twitter at The underscore Goldcast, and be sure to subscribe to us via Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Stitcher, all under the same moniker of the gold cast like subscribe and comment because we like to hear from you. And we certainly want to get your feedback whenever we do anything related to Bay area sports. Absolutely. And then where can they go? Candlestick will to talk to us specifically about these top 11 lists. Well, they can go to Twitter and they can go to top 11 podcast, which is top one, one podcast. And just, reply to one of our tweets about the different shows we've done or just send a direct tweet to me. Um, also, you can find us on Twitter uh, as well on our own on our own accounts and shout us out. Absolutely. And what is your individual account? That would be Candlestick Will. Awesome. And Raymond, what are your accounts? Where can they find you? I'm on Twitter at Ray Solis, and that's S-O-L-I-S, and on Instagram at Ray Solis one Awesome, and you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at my brand new handle, I am Rudy Third. All right, gentlemen, here we go. Final round. This has been an absolute blast. Our top 11 tournament finale begins. But first, the greatest podcast intro in the game. Class is in session. Let's go. San Francisco, are you ready? This is the Gold Cast. Boom. Welcome to another edition of the Gold Cast. We are the voice of the Bay. I'm your host, Rudy Salisa III, and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Salisa I, baby. And our esteemed co-host. Candle Stick will boom all right gentlemen before we get started i just let's do a little bit of a roundup and i want to know i asked this after after we'd done the totality of the first three lists and i want to throw it over to you candlestick will first as the godfather of the top 11 podcast how difficult was this final list for you was it easy or or did or, or or did you really wrestle with it? How was it now trying to put together the the three great runs these these three teams have had into one list? Well, it was just different. I think one of the things we were kind of alluding to is that you know what might make a top eleven for the individual team when you look at it from the Bay Area sports perspective. Suddenly, it's well, what which games had the biggest impact in the Bay Area more so than which ones had the most, biggest impact for a specific team or a specific fan base. So that made a, a big difference. Plus, more than half my list are just the six championships. So I think that was another part of it is that it made the list, you know, half the list was essentially done for us in, in, in a lot of ways because it's hard not to put the, uh, at, least, at least a game from every championship um, on the list. And, and then it was just a matter of where do you rank them among the, among the 11 and what other games had impact across the Bay Area, and was that going to be the main factor? For me, my, uh, as we get to it, my top three, um, a lot of it actually had to do with how the Bay Area you know, felt about those specific moments, more so than just how big the specific game was. So I'll get into more specifics as we get, get going, but I think it was, for me it was just different. It wasn't so much easier or harder. It's just that I was looking at the games from a different perspective. Nice. Raymond, what about you? 
You know, when I once I got going, and actually it was pretty easy, at least the bottom half, it was the back half, meaning 11 through like 7, that uh, I just had to think about a little bit more in terms of what order was appropriate. But for the most part, once I started kind of putting my mind to the dock, I was going to say putting pen to paper, but this was all typed out. So once I did that, it just it kind of just really kind of laid itself out very obviously for me. One one through five were pretty easy. I agree. Ten through eight were the really the toughest for me. Was really determining where games landed. And similar to what you were saying, Candlestick Will, it was. I had to kind of look at the totality, and I was always kind of weighing a couple different factors: the popularity of the team, their place in the bay like like what what's their standing in the bay and it was always kind of a competition between those two things like the popularity the overall popularity of a team versus like what a particular team means to the bay like for instance warriors you know being the one team everyone roots for versus the giants and the 49ers you know and so that was kind of always tricky and i think the warriors really presented a caveat because they are the one team that is designed to be rooted for by the bay and so that gives them a very specific unique um, entryway into this competition but i would argue that the niners are the most popular team in the bay you know and so that there, there was that to deal with as well and then the giants were probably the least popular team in the bay of the three so it was really it was very tricky to see to figure out how to how to juggle those three perspectives and and put together a list that i thought accurately represented um the top 11 games, and of course, like you said, all six championships had to be on there. There was, there was no way that those were not going to be on there. And then figuring out what the other four were going to be. And so it was, uh, it was very tricky, and I, 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 I really enjoyed this. This was a hell of a lot of fun. A hell of a lot of fun. All right, guys, let's get into it, though. Let's begin. Raymond, we always start off with you. Start with your 10 through 8. You mean 11, 11 through 8? 8? I'm sorry, 11 through 8. I'll just yeah. Well, we're eliminating eleven for this this championship <laughs> round <laughs> for this top eleven. Yeah. How dare uh, you? No. <laughs> <laughs> so number eleven, I've got the two thousand January fifth, twenty fourteen, San Francisco versus Green Bay, the NFC Wild Card game. Number ten, I've got uh, the January nineteenth, twenty thirteen, Green Bay versus San Francisco, the NFC uh, divisional playoff game, and for January 19th, 2020, we've got Green Bay versus San Francisco NFC Championship game. And for number eight, I've got the 2012, January 14th, Saints versus Niners NFC Divisional game. All right, what what you got, Rudy? All right, so for number 11, uh, November 1st, 2018, week 13, Raiders at the 49ers, the final Battle of the Bay game at number 10. December 29th, 2019, week 16, 49ers at Seahawks. At number nine, this is this is now, Raymond, We will, even though you started with Niners, I started with Niners, we now veer. October 28th, 2012, game four of the World Series, uh, Giants versus Tigers. And number eight, January 20th, 2013, the NFC Championship, 49ers at the Falcons. Candlestick Will, what about you? All right, so for number 11, I've got January 19th, 2020, uh, the 49ers versus the Packers um, in the NFC Championship game. For number 10, I've got January 14th, 2012, Niners Saints. For number 9, I've got December 8th, 2019, Niners Saints. And for number eight, I've got October 16th, 2014, the Giants versus the Cardinals. So, Ray, break it down for us. Well, the number 11, I chose the wild card game just because it was, I knew that the, well, let me let me say it this way. The reason why the Niners are in 11 through 8 is because the Niners have not achieved championship status as of this decade, although they've made two attempts. And as a result, I couldn't put them in the seven through one spot at all. So there's a, a hint. But um, 
I did have to put them in somewhere. And so I thought 11 through 8 was appropriate. And the order that exists here is really, for me, from my perspective, is the the significance of the game and, you know, how exciting the game was uh, more so. You know, the, the Green Bay Packers game, again, this was the, the probably some of the funnest games throughout this decade are the Niners on Green Bay because we just have their number. I don't think we've I don't think we've lost a single game to them when we've been uh, a, a, an above 500 contending team throughout this entire decade, with the exception of like, I think we had two losing seasons, which Green Bay beat us handedly, but easy to kick a horse when it's down. Hard to, you know, tame a wild horse. So that is why I have the wild card game. The next one was the uh, division game, uh, once again, against Green Bay. That was the 45-31 contest where both teams were pretty evenly matched. We had both teams had won 12 games up to that point. It was a shootout game. Uh, just a wild, uh, wild, wild game for the most part. And, uh, you know, this was the, uh, the really cool, um, we kind of, the rushing game, Green Bay didn't have an answer for it. We rushed for 323 yards. It was just a rough shot, really, really rough shot of a rushing attack from our perspective. Cap had his, you know, 181 yards, the infamous 181 game. And that's why that's there. But uh, I thought that that game was had more of an impact because of historical records were broken. So I thought it was more impactful than the wild card game, which is only twenty three twenty. It was actually a low scoring game, and Green Bay was actually a, a a less lesser team. They were eight and eight that season. We were thir- we had won thirteen games that year, so they uh, just were not uh, not as well equipped to handle us. Although they played a tight game in that wild card game, but the next game was was amazing because it was Caps like coming out game. He just destroyed Green Bay. The next one was the uh, NFC Championship game. This one I thought edged that cap game simply because the significance of the Green Bay matchup meant a trip to the Super Bowl, which we earned. And that, to me, uh, that relevance outweighed the Kaepernick performance in my book just because it's great to have a historic game in a playoff game, but to win a playoff game that gets you to the final stage means I'd take that any day of the week over historic performance. And number eight, of course, is the Alex Smith game, as I like to call it, the catch three game, the 36-32 win in the wild game that was, uh, you know, San Francisco came out firing, you know, 17 points in the first half, but New Orleans answered back with 14. And then, of course, that crazy, crazy last five minutes of the fourth quarter where we just exchanged blows. We put up 16 points. The Saints actually put up 18 points. But those two field goals in the second and third quarter really made the difference. And, of course, the uh, Vernon Davis catch, the the infamous uh, catch, and, and uh, the Alex Smith just threaded that needle. And Vernon Davis took a big hit. And it's so crazy how that game was so similar to the uh, – the the Green Bay game with with Steve Young and Terrell Owens just the uh, the the play the route the catch the the uh, the manner in which he hit the the reaction it was all just so so weird how it was so similar minus the fact that it was the Saints and not Green Bay but yeah but the the imp- even though the significance of that game didn't have as much weight as the NFC Championship game against Green Bay in 2020 I just think the level of intensity in that game especially the way the last five minutes of the fourth quarter played out I just think that that really outweighed all of these games even those the significance of the championship game outweighed all of all four of these game, all three of the other games I just think that the intensity level and I mean this is so subjective uh, the intensity level of the 2012 divisional game was just like cannot be you know, un, under uh, overstated, and that's why it was number one on. I think it was number one on all of our lists when we did the Niner game, the the Niner series. Yeah, and so I had to put it back there. So it's number one as far as eleven through eight are concerned. But uh, there's certainly bigger games coming up in the rest of my list. What about you, Rudy? So at number eleven, I did November first, twenty eighteen, week thirteen, Raiders at the Forty Niners. It mainly for the historical significance of what it means to the Bay. You have you have two major 
series or, or or battles that happen and have happened for you know decades and decades, and that's the Battle of the Bay, which is the Raiders and the Forty Nine ers, and the Bay Bridge series, which is the Giants and the A's. And so for this to be the final game that the Oakland Raiders are ever going to play the San Francisco 49ers, I just thought the significance, it had to be at number 11. It, had to, it couldn't go higher than 11. It, it couldn't go any higher than 11, but it had to be on her because it's literally the top 11 Bay Area games of the decade, and it is the final battle of the Bay. So that is my number 11, and that's why I put it there. It's the Nick Mullins game. He practically shuts out the Raiders 34-3. And uh, it just we just sent the Raiders packing, and in typical fashion, the Raider the Raiders are spanked by the Forty ers which is just so historically accurate and so uh, Chef's Kiss sweet. <laughs> so number ten, <laughs> number ten, December 29, twenty nineteen, week sixteen, Forty ers at Seahawks. You know, I thought about doing the same thing, Raymond. I thought about those divisional games, those epic games against the Packers, and they became really close. And the reason this game showed up out of all the games and why I put this one ahead of all the playoff games, um, it is the these are the only two regular season games that show up on this list from any team. And the reason I put this one is that the 49ers and Seahawks are easily the greatest rivalry of the past decade in the NFL. And not only, I would say the only other rivalry that even comes close to them is the Warriors and Cavs is, is the, the, other, the other biggest rivalry. But this is the biggest rivalry in the biggest sport between the two, arguably two of the biggest teams, and it's lasted 10 straight years um, out of everything. And so for us to finally best them in Seattle, week 16, to close out the decade, you know, the block two, I, I just I had to put that at my number 10 um, because we literally had not been able to do it in what it was like 10 meetings. And um, I just thought the significance of the 49ers doing it, I couldn't pass it up. I, I put it ahead of the of the of the of the playoff game simply because of the longevity of this rivalry. I mean, this is basically the Giants Dodgers of football. Um, number nine. October 28, 2012, Game 4 of the World Series. Giants blank the Tigers to win their second World Series in three years. Um, this, while we, we've talked, we talked a lot about this last week, a probably the least um, dramatic of the World Series wins, and that's why it ends up here at number 9 for me. Um, a great series, but I, I think the first, easily 2010 and 2014, I, I think are far more memorable. Uh, 2010 and its historical significance, and then 2014 for its just overall dramaticness. That's still my favorite World Series of the three. Um, so I put this one at nine. And then number eight, I actually put, it controversially, the January 20th, 2013 NFC Championship Game 49ers at Falcons ahead of Game 4 of the World Series, simply because it's a return to greatness. You know, the 49ers, the, what the 49ers have is something that the Giants and the Warriors don't have. And that's 40 years of, of, of excellence. Now, obviously, the 2010s is a pretty dark, dark time for the Niners. But you've got the 80s, you have the 90s, and then you have this decade. 30, 30 of the past 40 years being one of the number one teams, if not the number one team in their in their uh, respective sport. And this game signified, signified the return of the king. And that's kind of how I always view the 49ers. There's the 49ers, and then there's everybody else. And um, uh, love the Giants, love the Warriors. I don't have any real hatred for the, the A's. Fuck the Raiders. But uh, when it comes to the, the Niners, I really do see them as the – as the gold standard in the Bay Area for, for teams. And so for this game, for them to return back, to finally climb back to that mountain and to be at the top, that's how I saw it. I just like, this is the return of the king. This is, this is the head honcho of all the teams. This is, these, are the, these are the main guys. And so I put it ahead. When I think back on the last 10 years of the most memorable games of the, of the, of, in the Bay, the NFC Championship, the historical significance, and what it meant for the 49ers versus Game 4 of the World Series, it was kind of a no-brainer for me. But uh, Candlestick Will. So, um, I, I mean, I think we're kind of all in agreement that um, as big as some of the Niner games have been uh, this decade, that the Giants and Warriors championships, you know, kind of make it hard to put the Niners uh, too high on these lists. Um, yes, for a num- so for number 11, I had the Niners-Packers uh, NFC Championship game that just happened. Um, 
my my biggest thing for what games made my list were the were kind of how the fan bases felt after the game. Like in this in this moment by destroying the Packers in the NFC Championship game, even though they didn't end up winning the Super Bowl, Niner fans f- had to feel just invincible with the kind of season they had, with the way that they just completely destroyed the Packers without even having to throw the ball. And with all the big wins throughout the year, the Seahawks game, the Saints game that I'll get to in a second, and, and these other big games they have this year, that this Niner team, it not, wasn't even so much about hey, we're going to go win the Super Bowl, but it's like we're going to be good for a long time is, I think, the feeling that Niner fans had after that game. And so to me, that matters. Um, for number 10, I had uh, the January um, 14th, 2012 game, the Niner Saints, the catch three, um, simply because that game was just such a huge deal for the first half of the decade for the Niners. We all agreed it was the number one game for the Niners. And to me, that also has to matter on these lists, is just the impact, it, if it just completely... Um, dominated a team's decade, then that is also important because this, this, this Bay Area obviously has a lot of Niner fans. And that, that catch and that entire game was one of the most epic um, football games, period, not just Niner games of the decade. Um, and then number nine, what I have, this is my highest ranked Niner game. Um, to me, even more impressive than the Packers' dis- destruction was the Niners beating the Saints to finish off the three, um, the three game uh, gauntlet of a team with teams with 800 winning percentages, and then to beat the Saints in the Superdome, or that was it in the Superdome, or am I am I wrong? Was it a home game? It was in the Superdome, right? It was a road game. Yeah, so so in the Superdome against Breeze, Breeze playing at the MVP level, and Jimmy Garoppolo out outperforms Breeze on his home turf, George Kittle's run that, you know, everyone felt in the Bay Area. It was like an earthquake on the field. Um, Garoppolo showing, basically, even though they, they continue to, to knock um, Garoppolo on, on the national media because they have nothing better to do, um, he proved to me in that game that he will do whatever it takes to win. If it means handing it off in the Packers game a thousand times and letting Mostert rush for 6,000 yards, He'll do that if he has. If he has to win in a shootout, he can do that, um, and he proved it against Breeze at um, at the Superdome. So to me, to finish that that trio of games two and one, to beat the Saints the way they did, to me the Niners fan base had to feel even more um, confident after that game than even after the Packers game because I think that that Saint game is what made people feel like this team was going to win the Super Bowl even more so than beating the Packers because that Packer game was such a domination that it was almost boring in the second half. So to me, the way they were able to take, you know, all the three of those games were close, all of them right down to the wire. They only, the one game they lose was to, and it was just on a last second field goal. So Niners fans had to feel like, hey, we were right there. And then at number eight, I have the October 16th, 2014 game, Giants versus Cardinals. The Ishikawa walk-off um, and the Michael Morse home run to tie it, you know, a couple innings before. And, you know, that game to me, when you look at the totality of the Giants dynasty, you know, we'll get to some other Giants games I have uh, above it um, in a second, but that game was the culmination of we've won two championships, now we're going to head to the World Series for a po- chance at a third, even though the Royals ended up being one of the Orioles by definition were our toughest opponent in the world series of those three seasons um, because of the fact that he took us to seven. But I think the Royals were looked, looked at from giants fans as probably the weakest of the three because of how good the tigers were and how good the Rangers were on paper going into that world series. So I think the confidence level for that one was we're going to go into Kansas city and we're going to beat them too. Um, even though, as it turned out, it ended up being a much uh, more competitive series, and the Royals were were damn good and proved it by winning the World Series the following season. Um, but just the the way that they won that game, um, baseball history has almost never seen walk-offs to take teams to the World Series. So just the fact that that it happened in that game also, I think, is a huge part of what has to make it a, a game on this list. 
Um, and then just the fact that they were able to beat the Cardinals for a, a second time in an NLCS in this decade um, also I think has significant impact because ever since the 1987 series where we lost to the Cardinals, Giants and Cardinals um, has always been a big rivalry. And so for the Giants to, to beat them in 2014 again after beating them in 2012, um, I think was also a, a huge factor. So that's, what ha- that's how um, those four games made my list. Uh, you know what? Also, you know what's interesting to yes and you, Candlestick Will? I think the coolest thing about the Royal Series is we were essentially facing the mirror image of ourselves. That's what was so dope about it. It was, like, it was the same scrappy, nobody believes in us, coming from the bottom of the wild card all the way up to to uh, to uh, to the World Series. The only difference was... We were we were the we were the king that that was be, that was being trying that was that they were trying to knock off the throne, but we really were kind of facing the mirror image of ourselves from from you know three two 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 World Series wins earlier. Oh, absolutely, and I think the one one of the reasons we don't have to get into a big thing here um, and, and side, get side too sidetracked, but I think one of the reasons the Giants were able to to beat the Rangers and beat the Tigers so handily, and this happens a lot of times in sports was because those two teams went in way too confident. They didn't, I don't think they respected the Giants the way they needed to, and they came in thinking that they were just going to out-talent them. And I'm not trying to put words in those guys' mouths or say that that's definitely how it happened, but I do, think, I do think that sometimes in sports, when you, when, you, when you get to feel like everyone's against you and the Royals um, being a wild-card team and being an underdogs and, and coming from behind in so many games, they just built that you know, uh, toughness through those, those, those hard fought wins and the giants through, you know, giants torture and everything else, they had this feeling like no matter what the stakes, no matter what inning it is, no matter how many runs were down, no matter how many games were down, we can still come back and win. And that confidence level is the same reason that a team like the Cubs won in 2016 over the giants because they had it too. Um, and a lot of times the, the better teams on paper lose when the other team just has more team confidence and the Royals I think absolutely have that and it's why they took us to seven and nearly and nearly won so Ray what do you got for uh, um, what four through seven or seven through four I, I, I keep I keep messing you up <laughs> seven so seven through four I've got the May 28, 2016 Golden State versus Oklahoma City, the infamous uh, Clay game, Clay Thompson game. Number six, I've got June 12, 2017 Golden State versus Cleveland, finals game five. For number five, I've got the June 16, 2015 Golden State versus Cleveland, the finals game six. And at number four, I've got the 2000 or November 1st, 2010, San Francisco Giants versus Texas Rangers World Series Game Five. What about you, Rudy? Wow. All right, man. These lists are going to be so different. I can already see it. Uh, at number seven, June 12th, 2017, NBA Game Finals Game Five versus the Cavs. At number six, October 29th, 2014, Game Seven. Of the World Series, Giants and Royals. At number five, June 6th, 2018, NBA Finals, Game 3. And at number four, December 23rd, 2013, Week 16, Falcons vs. 49ers. Candlestick Will, what about you? All right, so for number seven, I have uh, October 28th, 2012, Giants sweeping the Tigers. For number six, I've got um, November 1st, 2010, Giants versus Rangers. Um, for number five, I've got uh, June 7th, 2017, Warriors Cavs, game three. And for number four, I've got a tie between the February 27th, 2016, and May 28th, 2016, the Warriors versus Thunder, the Steph overtime game, and the Clay game six. So, Rudy, I mean, Ray, break it, break it down for us. With pleasure. So the <laughs> game six, the infamous Clay Thompson game is there just because of the significance. Clay Thompson's performance in game six versus Oklahoma City outweighs anything the Niners have done in this decade by a long shot, mainly because 
it helped salvage a series in which they were down three and one and were up they were up backs were against the wall and you know winning this game tied the series at three three and forced a game seven which ultimately led to a win and led to a championship as most of us all know that are not living under a rock and you know clay thompson had his infamous 19 points in the fourth quarter including five of six from three-point range he shot nearly 85 percent from three-point range in that fourth quarter which was just a dynamite quarter just that quarter alone is pretty darn exciting to watch clay just refused to let the team lose and sure enough we won by seven points single digits so just a three possession game really uh, by the end of that contest and that uh, to me bared a lot of significance but it didn't outweigh spot number six so spot number six is the closeout game in 2017 the uh, golden state warriors against cleveland uh, cavaliers this was a more one of the more dominant series in the golden state warriors run they won the series uh, in five games really cleveland never really had a shot they uh they they won uh they won game 4 but uh game 4 uh you know the, the well the refs won game 4 <laughs> yeah i mean the warriors always you know they always tend to sometimes they just get cheeky and always let one slip out of a series sometimes there was only one season where they really kind of dominated the entire playoff run i think it was this year i think it was, or the next year maybe but um this uh this game mainly for a closeout game, not necessarily for any one particular player performance. Although, you know, everyone on this team played terrific. Curry had 12 points in the the first quarter of that game. Uh, Kevin Durant had 13 in the second quarter of that game. And I believe uh, the, the third quarter was more or less even from all of the big players in the Warriors. And in the fourth quarter, as the Cleveland Cavaliers were simply dying uh, Kevin Durant dropped 11 more on them as Curry dropped nine and they just didn't really have anything left to do. I mean, LeBron put 14 points on the board, but nobody else really chipped in. J.R. Smith and Kevin Love made, you know, minuscule contributions. The game was already lost by then. But uh, the, again, the significance is really kind of what sold it for me. You know, you win a, you win a championship, you, you earn the right to be, very very high on this list and so that's the reason why that was number six and then at number five we had the june 16 2015 game six finals game so again this was the first warriors championship i think the first warriors championship outweighs the other warriors championships because without this championship you really don't have the dynasty that you ended up having this really sets the tone sets the confidence sets the the mindset of them really striving to go in and just win championship after championship after championship but believing that they have the team to make multiple runs to a championship and it really starts with that first ring and that's really what this uh this closeout game sig- uh, signifies for me and this was against against Cleveland again, who actually, you know, the, they uh, they won uh, game two and game game three to go up two to one, uh, uh, heading back and, and uh, before uh, or game three they won in Cleveland. So uh, the Warriors were down two to one in Cleveland and had the and managed to uh, pull out that really dominant win in game four, the one hundred three eighty two win. But uh, the closeout game was really kind of sealing the deal there, as they they went up three two. And in a do or die game, really, the uh, Cleveland just didn't really have what it what it took to close these guys out uh, for whatever reason. LeBron had ten in the fourth quarter, but everyone else kind of fluttered. Andre Iguodala had eight. Curry had thir- thirteen in the fourth. Curry really showed out at the end of that game. He went into closeout mode. He was fifty percent from three point range. Just a terrific performance, and just really wanted that win, and and got it. And then, of course, at uh, number four, I've got the uh, similar, the uh, the Giants, the closeout game, uh, 2010 against the Rangers on November 1st, the three to one victory over the Texas Rangers, who only managed to get one win out of that. They Texas Rangers again were really never into it. They 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 won game three, but they got blanked in game four. They got blanked in game two, and they got blown out. It was a more it was kind of a shootout in game one 
But for the most part, the Giants really dominated this team in 2010 once they, they got rolling. And this was the uh, the infamous, uh, you know, the the Aaron Rowan, Edgar Renteria, Pat Burrow, Aubrey Huff, Juan Uribe, just a bunch of uh, old veterans mustering up this crazy win together. Uh, and uh, Cody Ross as well, you know. Uh, and the, and the, then you had the young bucks, uh, Tim Lincecum, Buster Posey, uh, all the young guys coming who would eventually, and then the guys who would follow after that. But uh, this was a great game, terrific uh, pitching performance by Tim Lincecum, getting the getting the closeout victory, and uh, who really just pitched a, a three hit one run performance uh, out of him. Brian Wilson getting the save uh, and uh, beating the uh, Cliff Lee, the 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 hated Cliff Lee, who just <laughs> couldn't couldn't catch a break against the Giants uh, when it came to playoff time. And but to me, this this. This first victory outweighs the Warriors' victory, even though the Warriors' run was longer, going to five championships. It to me, I I picked 2010 because the Giants went through their dynasty undefeated, three trips, three wins, no losses. Obviously, I don't count the Barry the Barry uh, Bonds era or the '89 era; those were different eras of different teams, different, and even the sport itself was different. So you know, and plus we're we're looking at this from a vacuum of just ten years. So when I was weighing the Warriors and the Giants in in this list, I had to put the Warri- or the Giants ahead of the Warriors in this particular spot because I felt like the first game that set off the dynasty of the Warriors outweighed the first game that set off the dynasty or sorry, the first game that set off the dynasty for the Giants outweighed the first game that set off the dynasty for the Warriors because the Giants dynasty is unblemished whereas the Warriors is although going to five is pretty amazing I mean if you went to five in baseball and still came out three two that would still be a the most significant and greatest you know baseball run in MLB history Um, but at the same time I I do love stats and nothing in my opinion beats a stat than zero losses uh, much like the Niners 5 and 0 run in between the 80s and 90s so that's why I had the Giants over at the number 4 spot for my uh, 7 through 4 What about you Rudy? All right. So at number 7 June 12, 2017 NBA Finals Game 5 Cavs uh Warriors over the Cavs to win the finals final score 129-120 Similar to Raymond, we have it almost ranked very close, uh, very, very, very close. You had it at six. I have it at seven. Uh, this is kind of similar to me, like the Detroit Tigers uh, um, win in the World Series. It's it uh, it was, as you, Raymond said, the most dominant. And I think probably the one that's maybe the least dramatic uh, in terms of its finals win. And that's why I put it at number seven at number six. And this broke my heart. Uh, I had to put. The October 29, 2014, Game 7 of the World Series. Uh, I, you know, Candlestick, well, you've already done an excellent breakdown, and we've kind of already had the discussion of Giants over the Royals. Uh, this was tough. This was my number one on my Giants list. But when pairing it with the totality of, of all the games and then having to look at what this, what this list means as far as Bay Area, I didn't think that it— it ranked as high as some other games, and I had to put Game Seven of the World Series here at number six, and that was a, that was a tough one for me. That was um, that was really tough, but I think it was the right call. Uh, at number five, June six, twenty eighteen, NBA Finals Game Three, Warriors over the Cavs. wasn't the closeout game, but this is the KD Dagger Three game. Final score one ten one hundred two. It was, it was the closeout. Of the dynasty, we didn't realize it at the time, but it was it was the final win for this for this this team. It was actually you know the the it was the, the these last two games or the final two games they would the that this entire squad would even play in an NBA Finals together. Um, you know the the they sort of you, you know you, you kind of had mix and matches of them versions of them during the the Raptors Finals, but never all all here fully healthy as the way they are right here in 2018 and just that dagger three was so dominant when i think of 2018 and when i think of that nba finals that's the game you know it's not game is four. that the first dagger it's three game... or the second dagger three 
It's the second dagger three. The one, the one the where se- he almost has no reaction. He just walks, turns, and walks away. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It just, it was, it was so dominant, and it was just, it just, it put the stamp on the the dynasty, and that's why I had it number five, and number four, which is obviously. I have I, I'm the I'm the lone guy who uh, looks like still putting Niners games beyond the number the number eight spot. The reason I put the pick at the stick here at number four is because it was the end of an era, and it was the end of Candlestick Park. And similar to the Battle of the Bay game, it was the final game ever played in Candlestick Park. Candlestick Park, which hosted the most successful team of the past forty years, Candlestick Park, Candlestick Park, which is. Just so much history that sits in that park. It's been Steve Young described it as the um, very similar to Fenway. It's the Fenway of the NFL, and I totally agree with that. It's dirty, disgusting. It has it. It 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 is absolute hell for teams to play in. Teams hated playing in Candlestick, but it was our dirtbag stadium. And again, I just think the importance of the Niners. As a legacy team, the impor- the importance of that stadium, the history of that stadium, it, easily the most famous stadium um, in the Bay Area, for it to be the closeout and the final game, and for it to end in such dramatic sta- uh, fashion, you know the you can argue that the well you the the, the, the it's not even an argument, it's just a fact the the dynasty for the 49ers, this run, this 40 year run uh, that they've had as being one of, if not the best team in the NFL or one of the best teams in the NFL, begins with the catch, you know, Joe Montana, Dwight Clark. And so for it to begin with the catch and the final game at Candlestick to end with an interception, it was so poetic. I mean, you just can't write things this good. And for me, it was it actually it 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 trumps those other games because of the historical significance of what Candlestick meant to the 49ers and to the Bay Area and what that stadium means and had the amount of success. So to close it out and to say goodbye forever to that stadium, to me, actually trumped these other games, as crazy as that sounds. That's that, that's uh, that's why I put it at my number four. But it's not more important than the games at three through one. That's for so sure. So Candlestick Will, that's for sure. Candlestick Will, what? Uh, let's talk about your seven through four how did they end up where they were? What, let's break down your list. So, so I had the Giants-Tigers uh, second championship at number seven um, to sweep the Tigers after what they went through to get out of uh, the Cincinnati series and then the, the Cardinals series. The Giants-Tigers game, it gave the Giants two titles in three years. It gave them two titles in the only two years that Buster Posey was healthy. So just the feeling in that, fan within that fan base was that here you have the San Francisco Giants um they're they weren't a fluke the that one that one random championship from 2010 that might have seemed like luck or seemed like you know it was an accident now you know there's something to it and that this this team could um could you know start to build something for a while and Buster Posey was the fir- the first name on that list of reasons why um, for number six, I have the first championship um, on November 1st, 2010. Uh, Giants beating the Rangers breaks the 50-plus year uh, World Series drought. Um, the first championship for the Giants. The biggest reason that it belongs um, in, in the top six for me is the fact that the Giants walk away from that series and walk away from that season with... Tim Lincecum having back-to-back Cy Youngs and then in the playoffs proving to be the most dominant pitcher in the world. Matt Cain having a 0.00 ERA throughout the postseason. Bumgarner throwing eight shutout innings in the World Series. And then Buster Posey winning Rookie of the Year and looking like he could be a middle-of-the-order um, force and a catcher that could uh, lead this team for years to come. And Bruce Bochy. Um, showing his, you know, magician-like uh, ability to uh, have the, the right guys in the right position at the right time, and so there were some feelings after that game, like okay, this we might not be the Braves yet, but we have the building blocks for what the Braves were. Um, obviously, that didn't happen the way it did, you know, it didn't turn out that way, but that three-headed monster had been formed um, in that World Series. After seeing Bumgarner go eight shutout at, at 20 years old, 
Matt Cain be perfect in the in the postseason, and neither one being anywhere near as good as Tim Lincecum. Um, that combined with with Buster Posey, you know, being the the phenom that he was supposed to be, um, to me that that series was a pretty special one, and that game was a pretty special one for what it meant to the city, for what it meant to the the team, and for what it meant to the the the, the games that would would follow it. Um, for number five, I have the Kevin Durant dagger three. Um, so not the not the actual uh, game five championship game um, from that season in 2017, but the game three dagger because in that season that was the season of redemption. That was the season after losing in 2016, after breaking every record humanly possible. Um, they go into um, that series. They're up two games to nothing. Cavaliers have to win at home. The game's close. The Cavaliers could have easily won. And then Kevin Durant, the guy the Warriors went out after, the guy that everyone um, was pissed at because he picked the Warriors over everybody else, um, and they were jealous and bitter that he did that, that his three being the difference and shutting down the Cavs, putting the Warriors up three games to nothing, to me that game is way more significant than game five because the, that series was done. Um, I know there was probably some fleeting thoughts of after the game four loss, that you know the Cavs are the first team to ever win when down 3-1. Are they going to be the first team ever to win when down 3-0? And there was no chance. Um, the Warriors were just too damn good. Um, KD was too damn good. Steph was too damn good. Clay was too damn good. Draymond was too damn good. Iguodala was too damn good. Um, that team was loaded. That that team was loaded, and that game was the the, the culmination of that, um, even more so than Game Five, in my opinion, which is why Game Five actually doesn't even make my list as a spoiler alert. Um, and then for number four, I have the two games against the Thunder um, from that 2016 season that ended up not being, um, you know, what it was supposed to be, um, simply because the impact that had on all of sports. Um, on all of basketball, on and on all of the Bay Area, the S- Steph OT game winner, at you know essentially at the buzzer, to walk off in in Oklahoma. They were 51 and five. I know I know we we talked about this during the Warriors uh, top 11, but f- their record that season at any point was just absurd. The fact they were 24 and 0, the fact they were 51 and five going into that game. The fact that they won 73 games, every single game was was like the Beatles came into town, and and then put on a show that left everyone speechless. So when Steph hit that game winner, everyone knew the Warriors were just unbelievable. And this is before Kevin Durant. This is before um, all of that. Steph was proving to be a, just a generational talent beyond anything we've ever seen. And then that Clay Thompson game, just to me signified even more so than the game seven win um, because that game six win in Oklahoma City that killed the Thunder the same way the game three did with the Cavs in 2017 and the fact that Klay Thompson was even more dominant than Steph just proved how damn good that 73 win team was because it wasn't just Steph dragging a bunch of dudes it was an entire team of of studs and that happened to be you know Klay's biggest moment in that season but those two games, to me, get a high ranking because of just how much sheer dominance and, and utter fascination the entire world had with the Warriors at that moment. And to me, even though they didn't end up winning the championship that year, it was the culmination of everything Steph had built um, through the, the losses of his first few seasons all the way up until that 73-win domination season. Um, and even though they didn't finish it off, those two games to me are going to live forever um, as part of this dynasty legacy. So to me, that even was deserved to be higher than, um, than some of the other games that we could put up on this list. Yeah, so um, we're, we've got some honorable mention now. So Ray, what do you have for some honorable mention? So honorable mentions, I have the uh, one of the games that you had on the list, the 2019 Week 14 shootout against New Orleans in New Orleans, the Jimmy G out duels Drew Brees game, the 48-46 win. I've also got the June 11, 2015 game, Golden State versus Cleveland Finals game four, the Iggy dominates LeBron James game. 
And I've got the 2012 October 5th Detroit versus San Francisco World Series Game 2. What about you, Rudy? All right. So at number three, all the 49ers Packers playoff games because <laughs> they're all they're all just incredibly dominant and just an ass whooping showing. Raymond, you talked about the sheer dominance and just how exciting it is, especially if, if you're an older fan like the three of us who lived through the 90s and had to see the Packers, you know, kind of consistently. We went from the, the Cowboys stealing our thunder to the Packers stealing our thunder. So to be able to dominate the Packers in just the devastating fashion we have is uh, made it at my number three. At number two, uh, I talked a little bit about this earlier, the 2012 Giants playoff run. Um, You know, facing elimination, two series in a row. I mean, just these guys should have laid down and died so many different times. And we talked, we've said it a couple times already during during the top 11 that, you know, the, the 2012 World Series win is often sometimes it um it kind of masks it was so it was it was so obviously a, a four game sweep it often masks the fact that the giants had the most dramatic run to get there and then it was easy street once they got to the world series i think they had they had just they had slaved off so much so much near death that it was by that time by the time they got there they were veterans so that's my number 2 is that entire playoff run it's my favorite of their runs and i think easily the best playoff run that they had, the most exciting. And then number one, all the Clay Thompson game six games. <laughs> all the he got, you know, he he obviously Clay Thompson was a huge dominating player in his games, dominated the Warriors top eleven top 11 uh, podcast and so without a doubt I had to put that at number one as the as the number one honorable mention is those games I, I didn't want to get through this list without mentioning those Clay Thompson game six games and just how dominant they were so that's my honorable mentions how about you Candlestick Will so um, I'll give you a little quick breakdown of how I came up with my top three so one of the things I decided was if you are a fan of all three teams, when what were the what were the three moments where you were the happiest, you know, um, after a game because of how all three of your teams were in that moment is and I'll I'll, I'll explain in, in more specifics um, how I ended up getting to those. So by one of the reason, one of the ways that, to figure that out was I had to kind of write down chronologically how. Uh, how all the moments fit. Like we're, you know, I put all the uh, the top eleven warrior moments in chronological order, and you know, Niners and Giants, so forth, to kind of see where, you know, where where were the moments in this decade where all three teams were good at the same time. And so, in doing that, my honorable mention ends up being chronological. So uh, these are more just shout outs. Most of these games we've already mentioned one way or another, and a lot of them are from the the previous podcast. But the the one thing from 2010 I want to shout out is that. Game 162 against the Padres, the Tim, the Tim Lincecum domination against the Braves in Game 1, and then being able to beat the Phillies in 6. In 2012, the, the perfect game from Matt Cain and the Reds and Cardinals comeback series. In 2013, the Steph Curry being able to beat the Nuggets and almost beating the Spurs. Then in 2013, beating the Falcons, those two games in the NFC Championship game at the start of the, the, of the year, and then being able to beat them at the stick um, for the final home game. Uh, 2014, being able to beat the, the Niners, beating the Panthers, Kaepernick versus Cam Newton, um, how big that moment was at the time. Um, 2015, beating the Celtics to go 24-0 and and being able to start the year with the, the greatest win streak to ever start a season. 2016, being able to beat the Grizzlies for, games, for the 73rd win. Um, an underrated one, 2017, Jimmy G beating the Rams to finish that season 5-0 and as a starter. Um, 2018 and 2019 uh, playoff wins against the Rockets for the Warriors, and then finally that 2019 uh, Seahawk win um, at the end of the year uh, with the Dre Greenlaw um, tackle. And then honorable mention also anytime the Do- the anytime the uh, Giants beat the Dodgers, anytime the Niners beat <laughs> anytime the Niners beat the Seahawks, and anytime the Warriors beat the Rockets. So uh, so Ray, without further ado, what is your top three? Mo- games of the decade oh man here we go here we go pay dirt what everyone's paid a ticket for all right so at number three i've got the october 28th 2012 san francisco giants versus the detroit tigers world series game four 
Number two, I've got the June 8th, 2018 Golden State versus Cleveland Finals Game 4. And at number one, I've got the October 29th, 2014 San Francisco Giants versus the Kansas City Royals World Series Game 7. Oh, nice. All right, Rudy, what do you... Rudy, what do you got? All right. At number three, November 1st, 2010, Game 5 of the World Series, Giants defeat the Rangers. At number two, controversially to you guys, but to me, no question, January 14th, 2012, NFC Divisional Playoffs, Saints at 49ers to catch (laughs) three. And at number one, June 16th, 2015, NBA Finals, Game 6, Warriors at Cavaliers. Candlestick Will, what about you, buddy? So the three championships that meant the most to the Bay Area are. (laughs) uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, I didn't mean to say that condescendingly like I had the right list, but June (laughs) June 6, 2018 is my number three, Warriors at Cavs. Number two is October 29th, 2014, Giants at Royals. Um, and, uh, number one is June 16th, 2015 warriors at Cavs. Ooh, we have one tie, one tie. (laughs) (laughs) All right, right, Ray, give it to us. All right. So I had to pick, I I had to pick, uh, game four of the giants at tigers, because once again, not only was the giants world series, a undefeated world series dynasty, but this particular series, out of all the series they played, was the most dominant. The 4-0 sweep against a team that was had a terrific lineup and terrific playoff pitching. But uh, and the Giants had really tough, more more difficult a more difficult time in the previous two series. But as soon as they got to Detroit, they just steamrolled them. Steamrolled them in terms of pitching. You know. Uh, Although the first game eight to three was a blowout, but the next two games those were those were actually the next three games were all save opportunity games. So meaning th- you know th- for those of you who don't watch baseball and you live on your rock, that's three <laughs> run you know a game that's within three three runs it requires your closer to come in to save the game, and that to me the significance of sweeping a team that was as powerful as the Detroit Tigers were on both sides of the ball and being part of this you know the middle of this dynasty which i believe was the apex of the dynasty in my opinion just in my opinion the apex of a dynasty is really when the team is most dominant and this was that that apex for me so that's why it was number 3 but i don't think it outweighed the Warriors uh, 2018 championship because this was the championship that really solidified the series, the the uh, solidified the the legacy, and this was the fourth year in in that run, and after losing that that heartbreaking one, so going to four straight finals, winning three of four, that to me was uh, I I thought outweighed the uh, the second championship because this was obviously championship number three and this championship was huge. This was the sweep again. This, 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 this sweep I thought was more dominant than the giant sweep because again, the giant sweep required a closer, meaning that it was a tight game. If it's not a tight game, you don't bring out Sergio Romo in that series, but they needed him in order to get past those games. And even the games, even the two games that were shutouts and the, and the final game being a one run game, but this this series was even more dominant. The the Warriors blew them out in Game One by ten points. Blew them out in Game Two by uh, seventeen po- or I'm sorry, uh, eighteen nineteen points. Uh, they they won Game Three by eight points. So the, the Cleveland made it a little bit more interesting. And then Cleveland just straight up died in Game Four, losing one away to eighty five. Just uh, they died a horrible death. It's almost like. Uh, it's almost Raymond, like, a beautiful death, a beautiful death. Yes. Uh, it, it, depending on how you look at it, uh, a beautiful death. Yeah. I mean, all, <laughs> all of their, uh, what was this? Uh, the, the fourth quarter of that game, LeBron had three points 
I believe, in that fourth quarter. Just Did he have three? I don't remember a, that. I forgot that. A dismal, a dismal fourth quarter for LeBron James. Kevin Love and J.R. Smith didn't even play in the fourth. Straight up gave up. This was just horrible. Rodney Hood came off the bench and put up seven points. He put up the most points out of anybody um, in that fourth quarter. Meanwhile, Steph Curry had 12, and it, it, it wasn't even necessary. Draymond, Kevin, and and Kevin Durant each put in two points. Not, not really much of an effort there, but... Uh, Steph, Steph Curry was really the one that closed out the fourth quarter. He, he closed it out and just made sure that the victory was sealed and that there was going to be no attempt to come back. Although, you know, not to say that Clay didn't contribute because he put in 10 points in the previous quarter. You know, he certainly showed out LeBron James, by the way, LeBron James had four points in the third quarter. So LeBron James progressively got worse as this game went on. That, that is what I love about this game. He had eight points in the second quarter, four points in the third quarter, three points in the fourth quarter. He just straight up just defeated straight up. And he, he had eight points in the first quarter too. So he, he matched his f- sec- first quarter and second quarter were equal in terms of productivity. But Steph Curry opened the game with 12 points and closed the game with 12 points. Just a magnificent performance. This really could have gone either way in terms of MVP voting voting for me, but Durant did have some big, uh, big moments in that series as well, where, where, uh, and he was much more consistent overall. But uh, that's why it was number two, and then number seven, or I mean number seven, uh, number one is really more obvious uh, for me and perhaps some other fans listening. To to me, game seven of the Kansas City Royals Giants series is a encapsulates what is the single greatest pitching performance in Major League Baseball World Series history. And that, to me, outweighed anything that the Warriors had done in their series. Although, you know, the whole... Maybe had they won the 73-win season. If they won that, that that would have been number one, probably, in in my list, because you become the greatest of all time in, in in the association and perhaps all of sports. But the, having the single, the fact that Bum, Madison Bumgarner single-handedly won three of those four games necessary to win the championship just speaks amazing volume uh, to me, in my opinion, in, in terms of how I weighed this list out. And I just couldn't, I couldn't put, I couldn't find any other reasons to to put the Warriors on a lower tier, or I'm sorry, to put um, to put the Giants to put anyone ahead of the Giants f- for this game. I was like, to me, because I was looking at the number ones of all of the three lists and all, all of the number ones made it on this finals list. But when I was looking at the number ones, I was like, none of these number ones outweigh the Madison Bumgarner number one on this Giants list. So I just had to throw Bum in there because you, you win three out of four games in a World Series. That's, to me, that uh, that just... That just kind of seals it for me, and uh, and so I, I had to give it to Bum for that for that reason alone. Just uh, uh, one man, it's one man doing uh, because baseball. So there, it's it's much more about one player doing something magnificent. Whereas basketball, you can pat you know the Warriors basketball is beautiful basketball where the ball gets passed around a lot. There's there's rebounding. There's there's assists. There's uh, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, contributions from other players, whereas baseball, a lot of, you know, a lot of the significance of an outcome of a game can be attributed to one or two players, you know, one home run, one great pitching performance. And in this series, this was all about Madison Bumgarner. Um, and so that to me really earned top notch, top spot for me. And uh, I really couldn't. I, I, no matter how many times I recalculated in my head, uh, Mass and Bumgarner always came out number one, so that's why I had to keep him at the top of the list. All right, Rudy, what do you got? Break it down for us. All right. All right, so for my top three, uh, similar to what you said, Raymond, there was it, it. I really also had to look at the the top three of all top three of all three teams, right? Like what the end. The top three, for, for those of you who may or may not remember, was... The 2015 NBA Finals Game Six Warriors and the Cavs, the the 2014-2012 uh, NFL Divisional Playoff Game Saints and 49ers, and then it was the October 29, 2014 Game Seven of the World Series. And I said it broke my heart. I was one of two things was going to happen. I either would have tied with you right now, Kendall Stickwell, or I was going to tie with you, Raymond. I really wanted to put Game Seven up there as that was my number one on the Giants list. 
But the reason it's not, and the reason the twenty, the November first, twenty ten, Game Five of the World Series, Giants defeating the Rangers to win their first World Series, the reason that one trumps it on this list is because Game Seven of twenty fourteen is the greatest Giants game played of the last ten years. I agree with you, no question, no debate. But if we're going best Bay Area games, I have to have the twenty ten game in there as the number one for the representing the Giants because it kickstarts the dynasty of, Sa- of San Francisco Bay Area sports dominance. This is the series. We don't know it at the time, but we are about to experience 10 years of Bay Area domination that we've never seen before, only to be rivaled by Boston uh, in the previous decade. And it's, it, the run that we're about to go on begins with this World Series win. And it sets off everything. It puts off everything in motion. Um, and so I had to put it ahead of it at my number three spot. And that's why it sits there. And um, But it was, as I mentioned before, it was very tough. At number two, January 14, 2012, NF, NF, NFC Divisional Playoff Game, Saints at 49ers. There is no way, given that we're doing a top three, or top 11, Barry Sports of all time, that the Niners run one that there wasn't going to be at least one game that deserved to be in that top three. I thought all three teams needed to be represented: the Warriors, the Giants, and the 49ers. And the catch three, uh, the historical significance, the the thing that the, the that I think saved the Niners this this decade for me on this list is that they had a lot of uh, games that were just historically significant to their 40 year run as a, as a successful franchise in the Bay Area. And the catch three, you have the catch in the, in the 80s, the catch two in the 90s, the catch three in the 2010s. This, in three of the four decades, the Niners have had a catch. Uh, 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 and, and to have this continuity continue, this game is considered by many pundits and most lists that I've read as the, in the top three, if not the number one, greatest playoff game of the last 10 years for the entire NFL. And that really means something to me. And for the Niners to pull this off, there was no way that they weren't going to get in there. And I think at the end of the, at the end of the decade, I I hate to say this, but you know, it it really just comes down to popularity of sports. So why does the divisional playoff saints of 49ers go ahead of, of the game five world series, even though that kick starts off the, the, the dynasty, the the San Francisco Bay Area sports dynasty that we've had, right in all of in the in the three major sports, and I think it really comes down to is that the 49ers are just more popular. They're just a ten times more popular team, and I think that if you were to ask ten Bay Area fans, uh, I think I think they'd remember the catch three before they went. They'd remember Game Five of the World Series. Now that you know that might be up for debate. You guys might be completely disagree with me on that one, um, but I just think that it just comes down to the Niners are more popular. They're just a 10 times more popular team. And that, that game, I just think that game is probably it's, it's etched in people's memories far deeper than Game 5 of the World Series. Um, I think Game 7 of the World Series is probably etched deeper in people's memories um, than the divisional playoff of the Catch-3, but not Game 5. And so that's why I put it ahead of um, the Giants represented on this list. And then at number one, uh, the Warriors' first NBA Finals win, Game 6 against the Cavs, June 16, 2015. The reason this one goes at number one, as we mentioned already, the Warriors represent the Bay Area. They are the one team that we all rally around. And this kickstarts the second leg of the dynasty, and it becomes the most dominating the most dominating five years that any Bay Area team has ever had in the history of Bay Area sports. And so it had to be for me at number one because it's the kickstart of it. And, um, you know, I don't want to say more than what's already been said. You guys have all eloquently or Raymond, you eloquently already kind of spoken about this game. I'll just talk about it from the Bay Area fan perspective, which is my favorite perspective. It it is the beginning of something that we've never seen in the Bay Area. We will probably never see again. And the NBA may never see again. This run is the most dominant run by a single team in NBA history in the modern era. Um, when, you know, when we have more than eight teams, and uh, and it's just the most dominant run we've ever seen in the Bay. The Niners have never done this. The Giants kind of come close. That you know, their their run is probably the closest thing we have to it, but not like this. Not like not like what these guys did. This five years with the Warriors was so special. Was so just 
unbelievable in its moments, unbelievable in the records that they achieved, unbelievable in the team that they assembled. Um, and this is it all starts here on June 16, 2015, when they defeat the Cavs. LeBron James, you know, the king, the so-called quote-unquote king. Uh, I said this many times. Uh, when the Warriors first go a uh, game one, when game one of the 2015 finals begins, everyone thinks that the Warriors are just another peg in the LeBron era. And little did people realize LeBron was a peg in the Warriors era. This has been the Golden State era. This decade will be remembered most for the Golden State Warriors and then LeBron and the, the 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 things he was able to do as a single player, but 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 single players don't win championships. They're they're not awarded to one guy. They're awarded to teams. And this last ten years is owned by the Warriors. It, by more, but but no other team is more memorable in the last decade than the Warriors. And their first championship to me, without question, had to go at number one. And that's why it's my number one. And those are my top three. I disagree. So just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm disappointed that none of you even put one 49ers game. Unbelievable. All right, Candlestick Will, your turn, buddy. Let's talk about your top three. They ha- they didn't win any championships. Come on now. I mean, I know, I, <laughs> I know, I know. This was born uh, a 49ers site, and I appreciate you uh, you putting the Niners in the top three for the for, you know for the brand, but. <laughs> they, this 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 top eleven it just doesn't happen. I'm sorry. It's, you're not wrong. That's the beautiful thing about this. That's why it's subjective, and we all get to be right, which is so fantastic. Um, I love so, being right. I know. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> um, so for so for me, so here, so I, I was teasing it this whole episode, but so one of the thing I did for my top three is I wanted to come up with the three moments, the three games, the three championships where. All three fan bases, you know, were he- relatively healthy um, at the time of the championship wins. Um, and so the, for number three, I had the June 6, 2018 Warriors versus Cavs. This is the third title in four years. This is the back-to-back um, championships where Kevin Durant has now won two in a row. And the Warriors have cemented themselves as not only a, a, a dynasty, but that a team that might win for a long, long time, and then, um, and then with that, uh, the even and because of their absolute domination, I was able to kind of you know freelance a little bit with the other two the other two fan, fan bases here. But you know the Giants at this point still had their three rings. They had gone to the playoffs again in 2016. And even though they had had a really rough 2017 and 2018 wasn't looking much better, you still had a lot of the core players there. Some of the guys were hurt. Madison Bumgarner and others had been hurt. So there was still a feeling in San Francisco that if the Giants could just get healthy finally, they might be able to, to you know, continue this run a little bit, even if, it, you know, even if they were clearly older and even if they were clearly not showing the same um, abilities that they were in past years. They st- even if that even if things were going to fall apart like they ha- ended up doing, you still had the three rings to, to bask in from from this decade. So Giants fans, even if they were a little frustrated that the run didn't continue, in 2018 they still had the three rings on their fingers to be able to sit back and relax. And then the Niners, after the Jim Harbaugh years, were really at you know the the low end the bottom of the barrel you know for a few years and it was really frustrating and in 2018 uh, in June of 2018 the Niner fan base was feeling like they had found their franchise quarterback Jimmy G went 5 and 0 at the end of that season so the optimism in San Francisco I saw so many um you know Giants fans who were Niner fans on Twitter talking about how you know the Niners are never going to lose again that Jimmy G's never lost a game in his career. That he's still, you know, he's still undefeated after going two and zero in New England. Now he's five and zero in the, in San Francisco. So we, we're never going to lose again. And that, but that feeling of optimism had been missing for, you know, four or five years because of uh, the Harbaugh, um, the way Harbaugh left, and then the the subsequent um, terrible coaching hires and and how that team kind of fell apart for a few years. So the optimism in San, in, in San Francisco for the 49ers, the fact that the Giants had already won three rings this decade, um, so they were still be able to, to cling to that.
but then the fact that the Warriors were literally the greatest team ever built um, in this decade and were the and cemented themselves as the best team since the Chicago Bulls of the 90s. That um, that to me is is why it, it falls at number three um, and not in the top two. The top two to me um, are very clear for me. The October 29th, 2014 game, Giants versus the Royals. Madison Bumgarner, you, you already said everything that needed to be said about, about his performance, but when the Giants won that championship, the Warriors had come off just losing to the Spurs in the second round, so there was this feeling that Steph Curry was becoming uh, a perennial all-star, an MVP candidate, all those kind of things were looking like possibilities. Um, the 49ers had come off of back-to-back NFC championship games and, and a Super Bowl appearance, and you know even though at the, at the exact time of that um, uh, World Series win by the Giants, the Niners were 4-3, and three in a season where they'd eventually go 8-8, eight and, eight and, and Harbaugh would continue to frustrate the front office with him being, you know, with him being Jim Harbaugh and him tending to do that at every stop he's ever been at. Um, but I, I, and I, you guys would know better than, than I would uh, at the time, but I kind of got the impression that the Niner fan base hasn't, weren't really feeling it yet that this was a, a, a problem that wasn't going to get fixed. I think the fact that he had had so much success the three years prior, I think there was still some shine on that. Um, and so you had a 49er fan base that was dealing with three, had three straight playoff appearances in, in, in its recent past. The Warriors in a um, playoffs for the first time in a long time, and the Giants having won their third championship. The you know the Bay Area fan that loves all three teams, you know, was feeling pretty good about themselves. But the number one mo- moment to be a, a Bay Area fan in the, in the 2010s was June 16th, 2015. Warriors beat the Cavs for their first ever championship, um, in, or not first ever, but first championship in 40 years. So they win the title. The Giants were still the defending champions after winning their third title in 2014, and the Niners had those playoff appearances in, in their recent past. So there wasn't a single uh, franchise in that moment that was was hurting. I know the Niners would start to hurt right after, but the I think the feeling in the summer of 2015 and the feeling um, in in, uh, in the summer of 2015 for the Giants and for the Niners, um, as well as obviously for the Warriors, was that this was the best moment in, of the decade to be a fan of all three teams, um, and so that's why it's my number one. Boom! Yes, you're not wrong. I, you're not wrong. I don't think anyone's wrong. No wrong. Every you guys. Everyone has uh, wonderful lists, and uh, I, I'm sure there's there are Goldcast fans that are gonna they're, 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 for every Goldcast fan, one of these lists is for them, and one of them are like that's my list, or that section and that section and that section makes my list. I think uh, I think this has been a wonderful top eleven tournament. So what say you guys? Why don't you let us know in the comments at YouTube.com/slash/TheGoldcast? What are your top 11 barrier games of the decades if you're including the Warriors the Giants and the Niners I mean if you want to if you you if you want to go all the way and go hey I'm going to throw Raiders and A's in there too by all means hey it's your list that's the beauty of the top 11 podcast do it and then if you want to get a hold of us on Twitter reach out at at top 11 podcast so at top 11 podcast let us know what your top 11 barrier games of the decade are let us know which list you like the most which you like the least what do you agree with where do you stand on all this let us know in the comments on both twitter and on youtube and uh so concludes another edition of the top 11 podcast we are the voice of the bay i'm your host rudy Slisa third and with me is my brother, my co-host. Raymond Salisa first, baby. And our esteemed co-host. Candle, stick, will. Boom! We'll see you next time. Same gold cast time, same gold cast channel. This is, this is the gold cast.